Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance, and HR, to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hello, welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hey, how's it going? You are an amazing person. I hope you're having an amazing day. You see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts, you get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So hit that subscribe button. I am here with my new BFF, Lisa Fine. Uh, you are the senior counsel. You're the director of compliance for Pearson. You are a uh, compliance thought leader. You run the um, one of my favorite uh, podcasts, the Great Women in Compliance podcast with um, our other BFF, Mary Shirley. So, so excited to get you on and uh, hang out and pick your brain a little bit today. How's it going? It's great. Thank you. I'll take an introduction like that any day. So yes, my new BFF, Nick, I miss you this week. So. <laughs> I miss you too. We had a blast at um, SCCE last week in Las Vegas. We stayed out of trouble for the most part, which was great. Um, and yeah, finally getting back to uh, the reality of work and back home, but it was so fun to kind of meet everybody face to face and be around people again. Huh? Yeah, it was really great. It was so wonderful to, to connect with our community and to get to know people as, as I've known you virtually now for a while, but to just get to talk in person and, and to really, you know, enjoy those conversations, learn a bunch and, you know, remember why, why our community is so great. And one of the best parts of doing this job. Yeah. It's something that a lot of people, I think, um, maybe lose sight of because we're always like heads down, massive to-do lists, a lot of fires to put out, but we are part of this really special thing. And most other industry conferences aren't, don't have the level of camaraderie that you see at our industry conferences. And you don't, and you don't see the same level of cross-pollination and, you know, people helping each other out. And, you know, it's like, you know, as cliche as it might sound, or as trite as it might sound, like we're all kind of fighting the same fight in our own little corners of the world and in our own organizations. And it's just so fun to kind of sharpen the saw together and sharpen each other and pick each other's brain. It's really a phenomenal thing and a special thing that we have to take advantage of. Yeah. And one of the things that I, I've always really enjoyed is that it can be sometimes lonely being a compliance officer, especially in an organization, if you're on your own mm -hmm. and when you're able to work with others and you know, all of us just want to make sure that our companies do the right thing. So you have an opportunity to share and collaborate that's, that's different. And I think in some professions, the people you automatically have the most in common with might be the people that work for your employer with us. It's not, it's not even a question of dual loyalty, but you have a commonality and an ability to share that's very different. And I mean, do you know of any other industries that it's like that? Yeah, I don't really be, I mean, I should, because for me, I really have only known it for this one. I would think that there would be some of the things out in like the nonprofit world okay. um, where you might be outside of the fundraising side of it, but in terms of, um, you know, some of the other things like best practices or things like that, that, that might be similar. But I think in many businesses and organizations, and when you get to your sales side, your finance side, the, you know, the, that revenue part, it's very hard to, to share that. And I think in law firms, as many of us have been lawyers at times, you, know, you, you can find other things online to borrow from, but people are a bit proprietary in part yeah. because when those of us are spending all that money for our, our law firms, you know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, they're not just going to start sharing everything. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, so, I mean, I have so much that I, that's on my list to talk to you about. Um, I'd love to maybe dive in and just talk a little bit about what your biggest takeaways were from the conference last week. What sessions uh, really resonated with you? What were the big, I don't know, lessons or, you know, things that you're like, oh, wow, that was a real light bulb moment for me. You know, there are always a few, and I, I think that at all conferences, if you come up with two or three really great takeaways, then you are definitely, you know, able to. I think one of the things that I really came from my, um, my podcast co-hosts presentation um, and was talking about communicating, communicating globally. And this may sound yeah. like a small thing to some of the more tech savvy people, but the idea of better tracking of um, using QR codes for how mm -hmm. do people find your speak up line or how do people find, you know, is, are they looking at your code? Are they getting it from on, online? Is it on an app? And just the idea of using that sort of technology um, was one of the things that was a, a takeaway for me. Um, I also found, was learning a whole lot about um, some more of the mergers and integration, um, which I think is just an interesting topic that that is just fascinating to me generally. And I hadn't paid thought of that hadn't been one that I'd focused on as much in the past. So I went to a couple of different really, really 
good, um, really uh, good panels on that. And I think the keynotes were, were, were excellent. Um, I guess the two things from there, one is, uh, you know, listening to the, the idea of cancel compliance culture um, and what that meant. And I thought that that panel was just fabulous. Um, you know, some of the, and the, and the last one was thinking, I think we all need to think more creatively about our profession and how we work with people to connect with them. And I really enjoyed when the violinist uh, Kai Kite talked about his journey and his life. And I, I feel like maybe being alone on the violin as a kid, you know, it's, it's not dissimilar at times to those of us who's, who are fighting our compliance fight. So just how does that apply? I always, I always love when we take somebody who does something that different and brings it to us. Yeah, it was such a cool analogy that was drawn. It was such a cool metaphor and there's so many parallels. Uh, that was a pretty interesting conversation. I wanna cir circle back to that uh, cam canceling compliance culture. And um, I think it's, a, it's kind of a big issue. So for those who didn't attend, what was the premise, right? Let's kind of summarize what the whole premise was and then we can dive into it because I think it's a point of contention in some, maybe, maybe that's the wrong word. Uh, it's a point of improvement or a point of opportunity for some, uh, for some programs to rebrand a little bit. So not, not to lead you too much, but what was the premise of that conversation and you know, where do we kind of go from here? Well, as, as I took the premise, um, it could be different than, than some did, but generally the idea of I mean, I was thinking a lot about the, the initial slide talking about rocks falling versus what does that actually mean? Um, so I think a lot of it to me was how have we built ourselves as a culture thus far and how do we best uh, move ourselves forward and involve and, and involve ourselves in the community and also think of it from a much larger and that came back to the ESG standpoint to me um, and how we are part of that as, as, a, as the bigger world and making things better as a whole. That was some of my take to it. How, how did you take it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this ESG thing was a, uh, a tune that was played throughout the whole week. Um, it was woven through so many of the conversations, even the, even the sessions that weren't necessarily about it. It seemed to keep popping up in it. And what I noticed was that there was a lot of, uh, I could feel the anxiety around it. I could feel the anxiety from folks to say, I don't know where to start with this. And it's not like it's a regulation that I need to translate into my business. It's sort of this amorphous thing right now with many sort of competing, uh, you know, we, we don't know how to implement it. Um, the thing that struck me with the ESG, well, I just think the ESG thing is a massive opportunity for ethics and compliance in general. Um, there's money behind it. It's a way to turn the light bulbs on at the top. It's a way to flesh out what our impact can be. We are obviously not cost centers. We are obviously not, you know, while, while we have that sort of derogatory label on us in many organizations and all those negative things that come, come along with it, none of us view ourselves that way. We all view ourselves as people who can make a difference in the world, people who want to make our workplaces better and safer and draw clear lines of demarcation between what's in bounds and what's out of bounds so people can run free, not this, you know, this noose around the neck of sales or the noose around the neck of operation that's going to slow down business. That's not how we view ourselves. And I think this pivot that's occurring with ESG as this is beginning to sort of emerge into the conversation, it's on, it's on the executive's mind, it's on investor's mind, it's on the board's mind and so forth. It's a way for us to take our skill set, which we've built over the last 20 years and uh, implement it in, with respect to this new thing. So the thing that I'm kind of excited about with ESG is it's just not, you know, let me back up. A lot of people that I talk to on this show, um, I ask them, hey, how did you get into compliance? And, you know, it's some story like this. Well, you know, I was uh, on this team, I was in legal or whatever. And, you know, my boss was like, hey, you're smart. Can you figure this thing out? And then five, 10 years later, I have the title and I'm running a team. And I kind of, you know, uh, serendipitously got into compliance. Well, that same dynamic is at play with ESG. What is this thing? How do we implement it? What do we, what do, we do? How do we make this kind of a part of our business? That same dynamic and that same pattern is at play right now, uh, you know, and there's an opportunity for us to flex those muscles, which we've already built and we're, all, we're already adept at translating this sort of, you know, this regulation or whatever into the needs of our business. Those same muscles can be applied here. And I think the amorphousness of this and, um, you know, is just an opportunity for us to assert our value in our organizations. Yeah. And I also think that, um, and Allison Taylor, who I'll just give a plug for, who Love is, her. yeah, such great. And, and, you know, it's one of the ones that I've learned a tremendous amount about ESG. And for those of you who are 
and you know, find it a little intimidating. She does a lot of great work on that and great work about compliance working, you know, with ESG programs. But one point that she raised initially that I always think about is we are always trying in ethics and compliance to have ourselves go from being perceived as the department of no and like a sheriff. That's right. how people perceived us. A lot of time, the ESG or sustainability or however you're going to call it were considered part of the investor team and they were the right. ones putting up pretty brochures to show that they were doing well, doing good. Um, and they're, they've evolved into this you know, different sort of thing as well. So I think you know, in organizations where there is already some sort of business, you know, have, a, have a, a, an established or growing function there, one of the most important things is to work with them and to bring in our skill set and our understanding of how roles need to evolve. Um, I also think that we have so much we can bring to that. I, I think it's we always have to be careful not to end up owning everything. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, I mean, especially like I, I'm not, I'm not going on the ES and G part. I'm not going to be the expert on in, in some of the environmental or the uh, you know emissions or things like that. But we can really help with making sure that the business case is done right for that and that we are keeping our organizations to do the right thing. And the one other point I'll make is when people talk about me as you know, you're not you're a cost center. I'm like I prefer I prefer the term revenue protector. There you go. <laughs> yeah, th again, but that gets back to that compliance culture. Yeah. We have to yeah. actively reframe right. uh, how we're perceived. And that's on us to do that. If we're just going to wait for, you know, everyone to just, you know, for those light bulbs to magically turn on, we're, we're really going to be waiting for a long time. But we're just in such a unique position because we're already this kind of circulatory system of the organization. We have to touch all these pieces and we have to make sure all these different sort of parts of the body, so to speak, are getting the nutrients that they need those pathways are already in place and this is just some new some new nutrients to sort of run through those pathways you know what i mean absolutely and i think that it, one thing i would say to anybody is make sure you're getting to know your business and the people within the business you know always understand what they're doing you know, won't know it as well as they do but understand what they're doing and why they're doing and then you can bring in all of these other concerns exactly. too if you build that trust early on um, you know, sometimes it can be, it can start from the, as base, the basic, when you're new somewhere, I'd rather talk to Lisa than the government. You know, I have to talk to somebody better her than them to, to becoming, to eventually becoming more of a trusted advisor or colleague. But, you know, once you start building that, you can kind of bring in some of these other parts of the conversation and, and they can raise it to you because most people really do want to do the right thing. They totally. just need a little more, you know, guidance. And sometimes between, you know, cultural and concerns and business pressures, it's not, it's not, oh, it's gray a lot of the time. It's, it's not always like right. you're handing somebody a, a, a bag of money or, you know, you're following every rule ever. There's right. a whole middle area. Yeah, yeah, we swim in that gray. And, you know, something else that sort of struck me during the, during the conference um, you know, especially as people were talking about this ESG thing is, you know, while no one has like a full ESG, well, whatever, I'm speaking in uh, broad brush strokes, nobody has, or, you know, everybody doesn't have like a full sort of ESG program that's firing on, on all cylinders. There are elements of things beneath that ESG umbrella that are already in place, right? And there's already data points that you have in your systems that you can start to bring together and you can um, start to show, you know, hey, you know, we're not where we want to be, but we're not starting from, from scratch here. And there was a little interesting debate going on. I'd love to get your perspective on it. Uh, some people would say, don't start bringing the data together until you have the program built. Other people would say, hey, you probably have some of the data already kind of out there. You can start bringing that together as you're building your program. What side of the fence do you think you'd fall on with that? Wow, that one is screams for the it depends. Yeah. Of a lawyer analysis. More gray, more gray, Lisa. All more right. gray. But I will say my view on it would be Keep, keep taking the data so that at least you know what's there. Even if the data isn't perfect, at least yeah. you know what to collect to go forward because eventually you're going to have to start somewhere. And I don't believe that I definitely fall on that side because I don't believe that any, any program is ever to the point where it's so perfect that all the data and everything else could be perfect. And even right. I would challenge anyone, if somebody said to me that they were 100% uh, confident that their program in any area was 100% perfect and everyone was perfect and working in all cylinders, I would think that, that, that there's got to be something that always needs improvement. There's got to be a challenge. And if somebody, you, you always have to start somewhere. So why don't you just at least get some information to 
Plus businesses, yeah. you know, finance and business people, they like numbers. Yeah. And you probably have some numbers already in place, whether it's in this system or that system. Again, this is not nine, 1996 and we're scratching our heads saying, you know, how am I going to do, how are we going to do compliance and ethics and so forth? We have a bunch of tech technology in place that probably has some data that we can get started with. And um, I, I kind of, I'm sure you can guess which side I fall on. Um, you know, I just I believe you're on my side. On that I'm one. on your side on most things, Lisa, as you know. Um, but if you wait until all the lights into town are green before you get off the front porch, you're never going to leave. You got to just get in the car and you got to get moving. And that program, to your point, is going to continue to change as acquisitions come in, as initiatives change, as you know, new risks sort of pop up. Those are all different factors that are going to make this living, breathing thing, you know, again, what, what program is like truly etched in stone, you know what I mean? Yeah, and when, when you know, when, if you bring it like, okay, I have this completely, um, you know, whole idea and analysis and a program I've put together and, and people haven't been involved in it or looking at Great some point. like a status or background before that, they'll, they'll be thinking, well, don't we already do this? And don't we do this? And what about that? And why didn't you talk to us earlier? I mean, I think that you have to communicate down the line and tell people, look, this is the beginning. It's it's not going to be perfect, but if you know, what is it, um, you know, per perfection can be the enemy of you know, oh, getting good anything. or whatever. You know, yeah, exactly. Go, yeah. And um, why do you think pe people struggle with that? I, I just find it so interesting because uh, sometimes people want to kind of go into the laboratory, so to speak, and come up with this whole thing and then they want to impose it on folks. Other people end up doing what you're talking about, having those conversations and so forth. Like, why don't people see the uh, the change management like impediments that they're building into their approach on the front end? Well, I think it's a couple things. I think some in some organizations and traditionally in some cultures, they expect you, you know, organizational cultures to come with your finished product for you to then figure out whether you know it's it's right or wrong. Like you, you're supposed that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And I think there is also, I think all of us have a natural, you know, fear of failure sometimes when you jump into something completely new without, you know, knowing everything about it ahead of time. I mean, ethics and compliance people are not considered like, we're, we're more risk averse than some. And if, if you're not more risk averse than some of the people in your company, then there's some weird things going on because, um, but I mean, you always want your business people to be wanting to take more chances so that you can explain, um, you know, what, what makes sense or to help get to the right decision. But I think it is, it's very scary to go in without have, feeling like you know everything ahead of time. I mean, I think we all feel that sometimes, whether you're presenting, whether you're speaking to others, you want to, um, you know, be as well prepared. So sometimes that turns into that. And then sometimes I think in some organizations, they really want to have the whole deck and know what all the potential consequences are. I don't think that's always the best approach, but I do think that, you know, in, in some places, I feel like they're like, if you flow charted it, it will work. So, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a uh, yeah, in a vacuum, this will work perfect, perfectly. Um, but it's kind of interesting, um, like how that ends up developing to different levels within people. That sort of fear of failure or whatever. Because like, if you look at a child who's you know tabula rasa, they're not scared of being stupid. You know what I'm saying? At some point, though, you start to tune into like how you're perceived, and you start to tune into oh, what is this going to mean for my career and so forth. And sometimes we, you know, obviously there's some healthy level of that, but sometimes it ends up going so far where it ends up almost paralyzing us. And I just think of somebody who's like, you know, again, somebody who's risk averse and they're going down a, a career path that's relatively less risk averse, whether that's like accounting where you can get a sort of professional designation or it's, you know, becoming an attorney where you again can, can get that uh, designation or, or degree. At some level, it seems safe because it's, a, it's like a predefined track. But there's also a ton of stuff that you don't know. Like your first day of law school, you knew nothing, right? And you look back on your, you know, as you're graduating, you're like, wow, I learned so much. And there were so many like unknowns and crazy turns that happened. But it was almost like the, the existence of the track allows you to sort of move forward into it or something. I don't know. And then you go practice law and you realize you don't know as much as exactly. many your employees at your law firm that right. I mean, may or may not be lawyers. So, you, you know, you, you, I think some of being a lawyer is, is, is like learning another language and how you can kind of work in that world. But the practical stuff you have to figure out. And yeah, I think that I think that the mindset you, you always feel. Um, you know, I think everybody feels a little bit of imposter syndrome now and yeah. then. And I think kind of getting past that and also a realization that sometimes you know, your questions are ones that a lot of other people may have also. Um, and also to think, I mean, if, if you're in, in a meeting and you have a question 
it's always good to do that because people may not have all the background. I mean, on the other hand, if I'm spending two months in a project, I will be sometimes so far in the weeds that I need someone to ask the question of like, why are we doing this? Or what right. are you doing? Because I know the answer to that, but I've almost forgotten because I'm trying to think about all the other smaller components to make sure whatever we're doing, you know, now that we've done something along the way and have some data, how do we get from, you know, point B to point C? Right. And I, you know, so I think, it, I mean, I think those things are really important. Um, but I, I do, I mean, we're all lots, you know, we always are paying a little bit of attention or want to be perceived as, knowing what we're doing and bringing benefit. I think people who don't bring their genuine personality to that, sometimes then you don't feel like you've connected. And I think that that's important um, as well. Point. Yeah, great point. If there's not that authenticity, it's hard to have an authentic relationship uh, that's actually meaningful. Um, you know, you just mentioned kind of imposter syndrome and that's something that I've been kind of, I've fought and battled probably my entire life. How have you overcome that? Are there any like lessons that you've learned that, you know, as you get those, that pang of panic from imposter syndrome in any given moment that you're able to process that more quickly now than you were, I don't know, earlier in your career or something? Yep. And I, there's the one, I have one lesson and I'm smiling a little as I talk to you about it because it does have a gender component to it. Um, when I, and I, you know, because when I was, like when I started law school, I remember there's a guy who like walked around carrying a pocket constitution, which I would never have done. But in any event, like these people thought, and it especially seemed to know everything that I didn't know. Um, and now, and then even after that, one of the things I realized over time, or as I was looking for new jobs over the years, um, it was almost, it was intimidating. It sort of seemed like, you know, men would jump in first. They would speak. They even, well, I don't even know if I would know if they knew what they were talking about, but it sounded good. They didn't. And then I kind of came along to the idea where I was seeing people applying for jobs and I would see women talking about it and they'd say, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. Oh, I don't speak Spanish fluently. I'm not applying. And then I remember talking about it with men and they'd be this, this, this. Oh, speak fans. Went to Cancun, ordered a cerveza. I'll be fine. So that to me, I think about um, is one of the things I think about is just some people, you know, and, and I think women are much more, are more likely to feel imposter syndrome, not, you know, exclusively and less likely to jump in for these sorts of things. Whereas men will just sort of, just put it all out there. So I do that. And then I, I mean, the other thing I do now is I think, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, right. somebody might think it's a dumb question, but somebody afterwards, I've had that happen before where somebody might be like, I don't know why you asked that. And then an hour later, someone will come and say, thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I, I, I think about those sorts of things, like nothing like this is going to be the end of the world. I, I'm, right. I'm not doing brain surgery, no matter what I'm doing. I, my, I would not, then I'd have total imposter syndrome. I can't, I, I, I faint at the sight of blood. So it's not, <laughs> yeah. those are my, just my little tricks to think about it. Um, but there are, there are moments where I feel that like shaking before I say something or decide to wait till I feel more comfortable. Um, and I think we all, we all do it sometimes. I mean, when you ask me to be on the ethics experts, you know, I'm thinking expert, whoa, what's up with that? <laughs> yeah. Well, we use that term very loosely around here. So well, no pressure. Thank you. I, thank you. I think, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting though, that, uh, that, that thing you were saying where men seem to like jump in more or something, what do you think that's, that's driven by? I mean, it's a very bizarre thing. And I, you know, you were kind of funny about it. I, I ordered a cerveza in Cancun. I should be good to go here. But it's something that I've heard from a lot of women. And as a man, I mean, I feel imposter syndrome all the time. Uh, I am in touch with my feminine side. So maybe that's a piece of it. No, I'm kidding. But like, what do you think that's kind of rooted in? And what, and what did you learn from this sort of counterpart that you were able to like actually Im implement? Well, I think part of it has come from different generations of growing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I... You know, growing up to, you know, traditionally women would try, and even in the workplace, would try to dress more like men. It was very much defined the workplace, I mean, as hours where one person would go to work and another would stay home, mm -hmm. men versus women. You know, there's many years, I think, you know, women who can be assertive can be considered bossy, men are leaders. Um, I think there's a lot of societal sub subconscious mm -hmm. messages, appearance for women is focused on more, not as much now, but it is still to some degree. Um, and there's a, I mean, I think, I think the gender dynamic of that is part of it. And I think that, I think over now, 
you know, children are being raised a bit differently with that sort of thing mm -hmm. than before, where men are, were encouraged, you know, speak, you're out there, do that. Um, or Got even it. girls, you know, wait a little bit more, see what's happening, or even more traditional roles in homes, at least. That has changed a lot, but I think that that was part of it before. Um, I also think that, you know, men just have sometimes just have more of an inclination to kind of jump right in a little bit. Right. I think in the compliance profession, it's also evolved in a unique way because I think compliance at one point, you know, some, some believe people just kind of, women kind of fell into it more. And then I think it became a more uh, headline bearing, you know, you know, hot topic kind of profession and then men have are, have come into it a little bit more too so there's this you know some of the some of the experts versus not I mean I think it's it's just been interesting to see that about but I think women in, in this field particularly hold their own ground and you know yeah I mean this this uh and this is going to be a good segue into the, ne to the next thing I wanted to talk to you about but our profession is full of strong women and I love working with strong women. I mean, they bring such a great energy. They bring the thoughtfulness. I mean, um, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of great value and heart and brains that, um, you know, women are sort of uniquely kind of positioned to bring, you know, I mean, just to paint in broad brushstrokes. And again, I'm a man, I can say this, but like, there seems to be like a little bit less ego involved and that ego can sort of turn into too bravado and sort of empty suitedness and sort of facades and stuff like that. And for roles like ours, where you need sort of a clarity of purpose and you need some authenticity and you have to actually make connections with people with, without any true like positional power that has to sort of emerge from actual connection points. Um, that's sometimes harder to uh, navigate for men, I think. But um, with respect to, you know, this podcast, this award-winning podcast that you guys, again, it's probably one of my favorites, um, you know, in general, not just in the ethics and compliance game. I'd love to hear the story on how you guys started this because you guys have really, it's been like a revolution across our entire industry. And it's made a lot of, uh, it's made a massive difference. Again, it's won awards. It's just a huge uh, platform for you all and for women to share their stories and their tactics and so forth. How did this thing come to be? What was the brainchild of it? And, you know, talk to me a little bit about that journey. Yeah, but I'm gonna jump back to one point quickly and then I will circle back to that. I think it's important to have gender um, diversity, but I think at all parts of a successful compliance function, I mean, with nationality, mm -hmm. race, um, talking about being binary, other, I think, um, and also lawyers versus non-lawyers, you know, find, I feel like for our profession, it's primed to be diverse. And I think if you're not hearing, if, if your voices are just men and women or white men and white women, you're, you're going to be missing something too. So I just want to always, you know, focus on diversity, age, you know, sexual orientation, I mean, you know, all of the different things, not only is it good for many reasons to have a diverse workforce, it is really especially important for compliance and ethics because you're able to look at things in different lenses. Even if one thinks that they're incredibly open-minded and doing a lot of the, the right things, um, you, you don't know. You, shared life experiences are really important in ethical decision-making, which brings me back to how we started the podcast. Um, because that was a gender thing. We were at an SCCE, um, I guess it was in 2018. Um, I think it was, was it 2018? So it's so hard to remember now post COVID. I know, yeah, it's just um, like that, that two year blur, you know? Right. And we were, at, we were at an event and we have a little like or, origin story video that Mary had put together, but we were at an event with Tom Fox and Matt Kelly and Jay Rosen, some other, you know, some of the, the guys we know and have been incredibly supportive and all I have been men supporting women who have joined us on the podcast and Tom's been our mentor, but in a lot of ways, but yeah. we were talking to them and he said, Tom, you have a compliance podcast network. Why do you only have men hosting podcasts? And he said, that's a great point. Have you, have you thought about, you know, doing a podcast and all of a sudden we really started thinking about it and then Jay named it. And then the next day we did a first recording, not sure exactly what we were going to do, wow. but suddenly we just, it was the kind of thing where once we kind of thought about it, we did it. And it, when you say we jumped in without thinking, we didn't have data points. We didn't even, I mean, we, uh, I went to Boston and Matt helped us figure out like how to do our, our recordings of it and what did we want to do? So we just, jumped in. I don't think Mary or I really like to listen to our first couple episodes now. Um, <laughs> we did it. And um, 
and Mary, one thing Mary did that I just am so indebted to her for is putting together the LinkedIn um, community because it's a really, um, that was a way people could connect with one another. We could build it. And it, it, we didn't realize fully what a need or what a community it would bring for others and for us. Like we get, when we get messages or people and, you know, they talk about it. And that was really a fascinating thing for me at SCCE when people would talk about it or ask about episodes. And you, you realize this thing you just kind of put out there and talk to fabulous people has really, you, you've heard it before, but when people say a person like, oh, I listened to your podcast, it's, it's a really amazing thing, but it, it really grew on its own in, in a lot of ways, but it also was something that we have, have nurtured in a way that we still seems you know, genuine to us. I mentioned that earlier, but this, what you see from us or what you hear from us, is this is who we are. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that really comes across in it. You can tell that there's a lot of heart and there's a lot of authenticity in it. And um, it's not that fake authenticity, which is kind of turning into this buzzword, but it's the authentic authenticity, if that's a real thing. Um, and, you know, what have you learned so much from it and what keeps you doing it? You know, again, backing up, like you guys aren't making a bunch of money from this. This is your sort of passion project and the difference that you're making in the world, or at least that seems what the drive is behind it. I mean, is that right? It, it is. Um, somebody asked us once if, if, if they would, it, it, they asked if we have honorariums for our guests and we're like, from where? <laughs> yeah. The answer <laughs> no. is no. Yeah. The answer is, <laughs> this is not, you're, you're not, none of us are making money from this. It, it basically now it's become just a part of my life and yeah. I, I really care about the issues and what keeps me going is the fact that I, I get to talk to really interesting people, mostly women, but they, and I learn from all of them, whether it's substantive, but personally about, about them and their lives. And it makes me really feel a part of the community. Um, and it gives an opportunity to share and, you know, like anything else, plenty of, there are days where you're about to do one of these and you're thinking, can, can I just reschedule? I, you know, this is, I've had a long week and without fail afterwards, I'm always like just kind of energized totally. um, from the, the people. So it's really the opportunity to, to bring something. And I think all of us want to have something in our lives that's both, you know, professionally related and can be a bit of a hobby. And I, we don't do anything that's the, that can be controversial, really. I mean, we talk about people's experiences. We talk about their lives. I mean, if somebody wants, if anybody wants to, you know, break some, you know, breaking news on our podcast, we'd be happy to do that, but that's not our purpose. Right. Um, and we've gotten to talk to some really fascinating people and learned a ton. So that's, and, and once you do it, you know, you keep doing it. Plus it, when it's, it's like anything else, it makes it, when you find out not only is it making a difference to you, but to other people, um, that's exciting. Totally. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a cool thing you guys have built. Um, I'm glad that you've gotten so much recognition from it, but I, but again, you don't do it for the recognition. You don't do it for the money. You do it for this beacon of, I don't know, this is going to sound maybe, maybe corny, but it's this, uh, it's this sort of focal point in our, in our industry now. It's like a main pillar of our industry and it's, and it's grown into that. And people, a lot of people listen to it. And I mean, I've learned so much from it. Like I've stolen so much from your podcast in terms of like talk tracks and ideas and um, perspectives and stuff. It's, it's, it's a really great thing. And to your point, it starts to build on itself and it starts to create this momentum. And it's a, and it's a really exciting thing to, to witness. And I'm sure it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. It is. It's, 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 and it's like, it, um, if I'm almost blushing from the things that you said about it right now, because I, I don't think about, I, I think less about the, you know, when it gets used for other things, which I love, um, because it's more of a, we're doing this, we'll get this out there. It, it's fun. And it's, you know, been able to, and, and, it, and it's benefited me in my career. I've, I've learned a lot and I've met fabulous people that I may not have met otherwise. So I wouldn't say, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's been no benefit for me outside of that. I get the opportunity. I talk to people like you and to be, a, you know, to play a role in a community. Yeah, it's really great. So how did, how did you and Lisa know, or I'm sorry, how did you and uh, Mary know? I mean, you guys have such a great complimentary dynamic. Um, how did you guys know that, okay, I want to do this with, with each other? Was it just because you were there talking to Tom? I mean, you guys obviously had a relationship yeah. before that. Well, we, she was my first compliance friend. Mary okay. met her a few years earlier in an SCC and she did a really great presentation. I was like, she seems like a, you know, a cool, interesting person. And that yeah. was, the, I didn't know anybody when I went to that first event. And then 
we kept in touch a little bit and she was still in Singapore. And then when she was moving to the US, we talked about different things. She was going to Boston. We just, we kind of just became friends. And she was one of the people I was always looking forward to spending time with. And we had already kind of given each other advice on different compliance things. So when we were already kind of hanging out and I think we may have known, um, you know, sort of in our gut that we could work well together because we're, we're very different in both how we either do the podcasts, but not our view of the podcast, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, tell, me, tell me some more about that. Well, I mean, you know, she, um, Mary is very much, um, and we joke because she's very much more of a millennial. So she'll want to do everything right away. Um, you know, and she, she responds I, I get a little more Gen, you know, Gen X, and you have to think about it for a while and realize people remember me. Um, <laughs> but we, but it'll be something. It'll be like that, and you know, there'll be, you know, Mary will often think about really substantive areas and, and send focus around that first. I sometimes am thinking, this is the guest I want. What can be the area for it? We both do both. Interesting. But there will be times where Mary will very much make sure that we are just moving faster than I might on something. And there will be times where I'll come back and say, well, did you think about these three things? Yeah. And suddenly we'll come up with something that works great for both of us. So I think we both really appreciate each other's um, way of doing things, but we know it's a little bit different. Um, you know, when I, I interviewed her once for the podcast and one of the questions, you know, I was like, we're going to do a lightning round. And then we did it again is basically because she does not like not being prepared for <laughs> things uh, I like being prepared but allowing it to go in different directions yeah yeah time. um you know you I remember there was one episode where you just did it by yourself and there's one that she did it by by herself and I don't know I was like highly impressed that's something I'm very nervous about like I I've never done an episode like that but it was like I listened to the whole thing it was phenomenal it kept moving um like how did you how did you get the confidence to do that well, part of the way I did it was when Mary did it, I thought she raised some really interesting points. And I, the first time I did it, I thought about that. And I, it was one of those things that sort of said that really scared me also. So I figured I should do it because what's the worst, another one of those, what's the worst can, yeah. that can happen. Um, and then the second time I did it was recently because I really, for 9-11, having lived in Washington, D.C. then in mm -hmm. the 20th anniversary and have living, lived here through the past year, with the insurrection and all of that, I really, that I realize now how much it has formed me, my career and working in ethics and compliance. And I really wanted to, to speak on that. And I wasn't, I spent time thinking about who was the right guest, but I realized also I was going to end up talking a lot about myself. Um, and if people, you know, I didn't want, so eventually, I, you know, the thing is, if people didn't want to hear it, they, they can turn it off. Um, right. But it, it is something I think I'm going to try to do like once a year, but more than that, people don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> well um a lot of people have built big podcasts of just them talking and uh i think it's impressive to be able to like hold the mic for that long and it not be like meandering and boring uh so good on you and if you wanted to change that to once a quarter i don't think i'd be mad at you at all um <laughs> i don't think i have that much to say i much i much prefer hearing about others um so let's kind of back up a little bit how did you end up in, in the compliance game? At some point you were an undergrad. Did you always know that you wanted to be an attorney? How did the, your life kind of hit some turns to where you wound up, you know, where, where you're at now in this as a thought leader in an industry that, you know, probably at seven years old, you didn't even know existed. Right. And first of all, I think everybody is a thought leader to some degree. So I'm just throwing that populist controversial point out there. But now that I get to do one in this talk, I'm loving it. But uh, <laughs> I think I'll take it for today, but I, think right. I knew that, um, you know, I think I, I always loved books. Like it came pretty simple. I had a lot of teachers and lawyers in my family. I liked books, but I still remember like when I was in high school, when I would go study, sometimes my dad would be at work and I would go sit in the law library. And I don't know why something about the law books. I knew I wanted to go to law school. Um, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do after that. I, I wanted to go to Georgetown. I ended up going to Georgetown and afterwards I, started working and then I wasn't exactly sure what to do. Um, you know, I, I worked in law firms, but what, what came over time was this understanding that I wanted to solve problems. I'd like to try to help people, you know, make decisions. I was not a brief writer. I was not going to be writing. A, I mean, I've done it and it was not the thing I enjoyed being by myself, being a long-term writer. And then um, 
I ended up working at Gate Gourmet and they were looking for somebody that would work in employment and, and, and HR compliance. So it wasn't, and a bunch of people that I worked with in the beginning of my career at, at the law firm that I was at had already had gone there. One had become the general counsel and she suggested me to the HR person who I, who's still a dear friend and mentor. And I really just jumped into it and learned a lot. And I will say being in the airline catering industry is a fantastic fantastic boot camp for every compliance issue known to mankind, whether it's security, food safety, food poisoning, immigration, you know, yeah. uh, unions. So I did that. Super complex it, industry. It's super complex and it's it, it, the people issues are, are huge. And yeah. it, it was a place where you know, like many, many companies, once you get there, you can kind of work your way around it. And I ended up because I, we had wanted to put in a a hotline in the U.S. and Canada. I implemented that, and after that, I just raised my hand to do the one globally. And next thing I knew, that was what I did. And you know, if you want to talk about somebody making a lot of mistakes, try being an American the first time. Go around trying to figure out how to implement a, a you know a whistleblower line in in, in Europe with yeah, work right. That, to, needless to say, that was a challenge. But I mean, I learned a lot. So that, and next thing I knew, I liked it, and I really loved the community, and it just kind of grew. And that, you know, so for me, I did have some idea I wanted to be a lawyer, um, but I didn't, you know, certainly wasn't thinking I, oh, I, you know, it's, you're not thinking at seven years old, you're like, I, you know, I'm going to become super, super famous. And, you know, yeah. beyond, <laughs> I'm going to be the, <laughs> I want to be Beyonce, or I want to be the compliance officer. <laughs> in right. right. Um, so you were working in law firms, you got to Georgetown, you're working in law firms. What made you make that jump out of, you know, the advisory side, essentially, into an in-house position? How did you know that it was the right time? Were you just kind of burnt out from, from these? Well, I, yeah, I did one step before that. When I left the big law firm I was in, I decided that my role was, it was I was running a pro bono program at the firm, and the role was going to be moved to the main offices in New York. And I decided it was a really good time for me to go out to Park City, Utah and book ski lessons for a while. Sweet. Um, so I actually quit in the profession for a couple, for it was only turned out to be about six or seven months because after, excuse me, after I got to Park City, I ended up working, deciding to stay out there a little longer. So I did disability advocacy work because I did not want to be at a law firm again at the time. Yeah. Um, and then, which I loved, which I will tell you, the things you learn in those sorts of roles in a middle point in your career are fantastic. I mean, when I eventually worked on some wage and hour things, I had actually recently been booking lessons and had knew what the meal and break laws were because I just just lived them, just little things. But I came back to DC and I was in a law firm for a short period of time and just knew it wasn't something I wanted to do. Um, and I'd always wanted to figure out a way to be in house and to also be able to work in a, an organization where you're kind of committed through you know, thick or thin with what mm -hmm. the organization's mission is, as opposed to, okay, I finished one big case, I go to the next, which is also fun. Um, so what, you were on the slopes uh, during the day and then doing disability advocacy, advocacy work in the evening or something? No, well, I, I you know, first of all, that during the off season, I did it more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, what I did is, I mean, I was able to, to work a very flex schedule. So I had, you know, one or two afternoons or weekend day, but I also, it was just beautiful to be out, um, totally. you know, out in the mountains, but I, but it was really, you know, and, and being able to kind of work in an in area, you know, helping, you know, people, it was a protection and advocacy organization that also, it's another thing I would just say to anybody, all your experiences that you think might not make sense, they reappear at the, Isn't you know, nuts? the time. yeah. Yeah. So, it all kind of comes together. Um, and you can see in the rear, rear view mirror, you're like, oh, well, that experience that didn't really seem to make any sense now is such a critical piece of my puzzle now, or it's a critical kind of cog in the machine or something, you know? Yeah. And that, you know, that was also, I mean, what, when you leave a, a job, when you leave a law firm and you decide to go book ski and live out in Park City for a little while, pe some people think it's, people will give you, will reflect their view on everything on you. It's rarely about how great it is for you. It's, um, did she have a problem? That's amazing. You know, oh, it's interesting. People, you know, they fill in the blanks with something yeah. bizarre. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple of people who like gave me business cards with, like from like law firms being like, we can help, you know. And like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm Thank good. you. I'm good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Hey, I have a question. Um, so I naively perhaps uh when I kind of got into this game, I viewed sort of HR in general, and I'll just use this as shorthand. Um 
as resources for the human beings in the organization. I think over time, I've recognized that there's kind of two ends to that spectrum, uh, where in many kind of jaded HR people that I've come in contact with view HR as almost like uh, how to, you know, a defense against the human uh, capital of the organization, the labor units that uh, the organization employs, and they sort of end up falling on this side of the fence of just kind of defending the organization against the employees. Where do you think we are broadly on that spectrum, if that's a valid spectrum, and where do you think we're going to go? And I think there's some corollaries with ethics and compliance as well. Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I think it, organizations- You can't say gray. You can't say gray. I'm not. I'm not saying gray again. I'm not saying <laughs> I'm gray kidding, again. I'm kidding. But I think we are working into a much more aligned way of doing this. I think looking at, at humans only as human capital is a real problem. Yeah. Um, because then you're treating it like a business unit and these are human beings. And right. I think human beings need to be able to reach out to somebody when they're dealing with certain things. Um, and I think that there are um, other things like that. I think the direction they're going is, is a little bit of individual, more, more being getting the pendulum going a little back towards uh, personal and help and services and things like that. And I think yeah. COVID is that. And I also think it's a, an increased level of um, collaboration with um, with us from an ethics and compliance. We have way more in common than we do apart. Yeah, it's this weird, uh, you know, and I think there was a session at the conference about, you know, uh, the sibling rivalry. That was or, mine. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a good segue into it. So <laughs> I know let's that. talk about that because that's what I really want to get at because it's a bizarre, uh, and there are a couple of these bizarre sibling rivalries uh, mm -hmm. within organizations, but this is perhaps the one that I'm most passionate about just because of the business I'm in, but also because of the impact that it can have on, to your point, the human beings that volunteer essentially every day, granted they're getting paid, but they volunteer, no, nobody has a gun to their head to show up at work every day and pursue this organization's mission. It can have the biggest impact on those individuals' lives, which then can translate into the energy they bring to their homes and the energy that cascades out into the communities. So talk I mean, to I, us about this thing. I just, I love it. It's like the next mile that we as uh, ethics and compliance folks and HR folks need to sort of traverse in order to really elevate, I think. Well, I think the thing is, I think we forget often the fact that both sides have to have a little more empathy for one another. I'm not sure if that's exactly what, what, what you know, your, your concept of it is, but at, to some degree, I think that on the ethics and compliance side, we forget all of the routine day-to-day -day things that the HR people are trying to do for people. And on the other hand, I think that HR folks are holding on so closely to tightly often to personnel situations and other concerns and things like that to the point that eventually they um, you know, they don't share information that they would, would need. And I think the silos, I don't know how we're gonna ultimately get there because I think, uh, I think that both go through such unique challenges, but I think learning that more and realizing you're much stronger working with each other, but it is also can be a challenge for, for what some of the kind of uh, needs that each part of the team needs and when they can you know, butt heads, you know, confidential investigations from HR versus compliance. Well, and you're kind of uniquely positioned to understand both sides of these silo walls, because I think you played on, you swam in both of these pools. I think met other folks are a little bit too myopic with respect to their own uh, experiences and so forth. Um, so what advice would you give for someone to uh, kind of launch forward and start knocking those walls down on their side? Yeah. Um, you know, just get to know people before a crisis, get to know what they're doing, get to know what they need to do. And don't just wait and assume you understand and know what the other group, particularly HR is doing. Understand what their business needs, what their requirements are and what the urgency is. Um, I think that's the most important thing to, to really keep in mind. Um, I, I, I Don't just call them for the first time in the middle of the worst investigation that you've right. had to deal with and then start criticizing what they've done. Understand the day-to-day. -day. Um, and treat and, them like a human being. Yeah. and And Treat them the same way you treat anybody else within the business and also, you know, be willing to share when you can. Yeah. So I want to be conscious of time. We could talk for another two hours. Uh, Lisa, I love your work. I love the impact that you have. I love your heart. Um, where I'm can so people find you? I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> where can people find out more about you? Okay, well, I mean, I, I we have our Great Women in Compliance uh, landing page, which is over at um, Corporate Compliance Insights. Um, it's, it's also attached to my, and on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. I work for Pearson Education, um, which is doing a lot of cool stuff right now. 
Um, and they also, you can find our book on Amazon, Sending the Elevator Back Down. We didn't even talk um, about the book. Yeah, my, one of my favorites from last year. Okay, well, I will let you go. I uh, had an absolute blast. Thank you Thank all you for so joining much. us. And until next time. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.